I want to invite you this morning to turn to a passage that I'm sure you all have memorized, uh, 2 Kings chapter 13. But if you don't have it memorized, that's okay. I actually don't expect you to. It's 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 a weird, it's an odd passage. And so just a little bit of background before we get into our chapter this morning. So 2 Kings 13. Um, if you don't know anything about the Bible, Israel, it's for the longest time, it's had wicked kings rule over them. In fact, they, they wanted kings at one point. They got kings, and the kings they got, they were really bad. They get their first king, Saul, then David, then Solomon, then after Solomon, two of his sons take over, and they split the kingdom of Israel into two. There's a northern kingdom, and then there's a southern kingdom. And that's all of the history between like 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. So you have these two kingdoms of Israel. And so Israel is marked by wicked kings. They're evil kings. But despite having evil kings, uh, God, He sends prophets to help the people. And so where we are in our passage today, there's, it's, it's in the reign of King Joash. And King Joash is the king of the northern kingdom. Now there's two King Joashes in the Bible. We're talking about the northern kingdom one. And so what I want you to see... Um, before we even get in, is in verses 10 and 13, verse 10 to 13 of 2 Kings, we have the summary of King Joash's reign. His whole life summarized in four verses. We get the indictment of his reign in verse 11, and you can see it there. It says that King Joash, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. His whole life summed up with that one sentence. His whole bio, just in four verses... And then we get our passage today. One commentator calls this King Joash's most crucial moment in his life. So if you want to know where King Joash failed, we get our passage today that talks about his crucial moment in the failure in his life. And so our text today is full of significant lessons for Israel, but it's also full of lessons for us today that we can learn something for it as well. Uh, so let's look at this, this wonderful passage, this, this mysterious, this, this odd, if we're going to be honest, this odd passage. And I'll start reading in verse 14. So 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14. Now when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father. The chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow, and he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The Lord's arrow of victory the arrow of victory over Syria. For you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you have made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. So Elisha died, and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived, and he stood on his feet. And it's a reading of God's Word this morning. Before we go further and talk about this wonderful passage, would you pray with me and seek God's help to understand it? Our Father, we confess that there are parts of the Bible that are hard for us to understand. There's, there's things that, that we have a lot of questions about. And Father, this passage is one of them. Uh, we, we admit to you that it can be bizarre to us. And so, Father, we need your help to understand this passage. We need you to open our minds, open our eyes, open our hearts to see what you're trying to tell us here, but also that we would see your son Jesus, even in this text. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, one of the most popular TV shows, especially amongst my generation, some of you have probably watched it, it's a workplace comedy called The Office. And so if you don't know anything at all about The Office, it's about this company that sells paper, and it's it's located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. 
And so the show's about a man named Michael Scott. And Michael Scott, he's the manager of the Scranton branch of Dunder Mifflin. And the thing about Michael Scott is that he's a terrible manager. He, he's an awful boss. Now, there's probably some fans of the office that said, well, hey, Jim said at the end of his time there that, that he was the best boss he's ever had, but that didn't happen until season seven of the office. Michael is an awful boss. He's a terrible boss. That's probably what Connor is saying about me this summer. But Michael, he's, a, he's not a good boss. He can be inappropriate. He's at times sabotaged employees' promotions. He can be insensitive. He blames other people for his mistakes. He's self-centered. He made promises that he didn't keep. And the list goes on and on and on about why Michael Scott is a terrible boss. But despite having this terrible boss, the Scranton branch of Dunder Mifflin consistently had the best sales of any Dunder Mifflin branch. And it was largely due to this great sales team of Jim Halpert, Dwight Schrute. Uh, if you've ever seen the show, you might know that Dwight Schrute one time even beat a computer at selling. And so this Scranton branch has been successful due to the people who work in that branch performing the daily tasks despite having this awful manager. And that's kind of what's going on here in our passage, except for Israel's king, he's not just incompetent, he, he's wicked. He's evil. And so it's been like this for many, many years. In fact, the Bible lists about 40 kings between the northern and southern kingdom. In the northern kingdom, every single one of them was counted as evil. Every one. In the southern kingdom, 12 were evil, 8 did good. And so, Israel has had some wicked leadership. And so, however, throughout these years, God sent the people prophets, like Jim and Dwight, that would help the people, despite having wicked leaders, and so he first sends him this great prophet Elijah. And you all have probably heard about Elijah. And then after Elijah, he sends us uh, Elisha. And so any success that Israel had, any vitality that it had, was due to these two men. And so our passage kind of highlights this very well, that the success of Israel was brought about by the prophets, not about these wicked kings. And so here, though, Elisha, he's close to death. He, he's about to die. And Syria is on their doorstep. So they start saying, what are we going to do? Elisha, our protector, is dying. And Syria is here. What do we do? And so there's three points that I think we can see in this passage today. Three things that I think is going to highlight, uh, that we want to highlight. The first one is the orchestrator. The orchestrator. The second one is the oracle. And the last one is the extraordinary. So orchestrator, oracle, and the extraordinary. So let's look at our first point, the orchestrator. And I think we can see this in verse 14. If you have your Bibles open, you can look and follow along. He says, Now when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash king of Israel went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. All right, so what's going on here? This doesn't really make a lot of sense to us. We're trying to figure out what is going on. He kind of he kind of doesn't use a sin sentence here. There's no verbs when he says the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. So what's going on? So... Before we even dive into this, we've got to understand the state that Israel is in. Mentioned already that Israel has been played by wicked kings. Joash is no different. And the text says he's just like his father. Now there's a lot of significance behind this because you see when Israel was split in two, when Israel was split up, the temple, there was one put in, uh, the temple of Solomon was in the southern kingdom and then Jer Jerusalem. And then in the northern kingdom, Jeroboam set up another temple. So there's two temples in the two kingdoms. And so when he did this, he put golden calves in the middle of the temple. Now, if you know anything at all about the history of Israel, golden calves is a big no-no, right? There's the whole Exodus, Mount Sinai, they come down and they built a golden calf that they're worshiping, right? So the king of Israel in the temple of the Lord sets up golden calves, and so it's just not that these kings of Israel don't just worship Yahweh well. It's not that they're just, just bad worshipers. They're actually flat out worshiping other gods. It's not that they're just not good Christians or good Jews. They're, they're, they've turned to a completely different religion. And so in addition to this, they've been constantly at war with other nations like Syria, Assyria. And their army, it's, it's been all but destroyed, okay? Israel's army is gone. In verse 7, we're told that Israel's army was down to 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 footmen. All right? It says, it says the, the king of Syria destroyed them and made them like dust. So their army is decimated. 
Their temple has been decimated. But despite this, verse 4 shows that they call out to God for help. Verse 5 says God helps them by sending a Savior. And so this is important because this is the very thing that happens in our passage here. They're wicked. They, they have incompetent, evil leadership. They, they, they've turned to other gods. They realize they're about to be destroyed. They call out to God for help, and God gives them help. Ralph Davis is a, is a commentator that I like a lot, probably one of the best commentators on the Old Testament. He says, Our writer implies that sometimes Yahweh's pity over the distress of His people trumps the wickedness of the one seeking Him from, for relief. Y'all hear that? Yahweh's pity over the distress of His people trumps the wickedness of the one seeking Him for relief. And so that's why I titled this passage, or this, this point here, The Orchestrator. Because God is the one who's orchestrating events here. He's entered into a covenant with His people, and despite having this wicked leader, He's orchestrating things to help His people. He, he intervenes for them. He sends them saviors to help them. Now come back to our passage here. We have the same setup. We have a wicked king. We have an approaching enemy army. And then what we see is we see Joash running to Elisha for help. The man who's been the defender and strength of Israel for his entire life, just like Elijah before him. And so how do we see God as the orchestrator here? Well, I think we see it in three ways. Three ways we see God as orchestrator. The first, we see it in Elijah, Elisha in his sickness. And so the text says that it was the illness of which he was to die. So Elisha, he's at the end of his life. Now, now think about this, y'all. Elisha had performed miracles. One of those miracles that Elisha performed was that he brought someone back to life. 2 Kings chapter 4. And yet now he has this sickness. How could a man that has the power to bring back the dead to life die from an illness? And I love this, what it says here is the, t- the illness that which he was to die from. God's appointing this illness to come for Elisha. Here God is saying it's time for Elisha to go. And with him goes his protection of Israel. And so who's going to replace Elisha? After Elijah, we got Elisha. So who's going to replace Elisha? Who are they going to look to for help? So we see that God is even orchestrating this illness. Second thing we see, Joash acknowledging this. He says the phrase, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. Now this, this may not mean anything to you, but it's actually pretty significant because it's the same words that Elisha says to Elijah when Elijah is dying. 2 Kings chapter 2. And so by saying this, what Joash is doing is he's acknowledging that God is the true strength of Israel. And as the prophet is slipping away, so is that strength. And so Joash, what he does is he seeks help from God, the one who can orchestrate the victory for them. Remember, their army is decimated. We need God's help to defeat Syria. And the third way we see God acting as the orchestrator here is he gives them an oracle. He gives them an oracle. And that's actually going to be our second point we're going to talk about in just a minute. But before we look at the oracle, I want to make one last observation here that we can apply this to our lives. There's a massive message happening here, and it happens all throughout Scripture. And it's this message of that the battle belongs to the Lord. Victory or defeat only happens because God orchestrates it to be so. And so consider these promises throughout Scripture. Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. All you have to do is be silent. 2 Chronicles 25, do not be afraid. The battle is not yours, but God's. 1 Samuel 17, 47, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. The battle belongs to the Lord. Now, I can really only imagine the battles that you are engaged in right now. Maybe it's relationship with your kids or your parents. Maybe it's financial hardships or or a struggling marriage or abuse or trauma, doubts, insecurities, acceptance, illness, addiction, death and loss, busyness, feelings of inadequacy. The list can really go on and on and on about the battles that we face. And so Redeemer Saltillo, opposition is always going to come. Opposition is always going to be there. We're not promised comfort in this life. But God is even in control over these things. And so this is what it means that the battle belongs to the Lord. For those who are in Christ, 
you fight your battles knowing that it's God who strengthens you. As the great hymn says from Martin Luther, He must win the battle. Now this doesn't mean that there's not going to be setbacks. The victory of the battle may not even come in this life. But it will come in the next. Regardless of what happens, He will win. 1 John 5.4 says this, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. That's our victory. And so through faith in Christ, we too can rest in knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord. So let's look at this second point, the oracle here, this third way in which God is orchestrating events. So I mentioned that there was one more act that showed God was orchestrating things, and it's this oracle that He gives. And so we get to the meat of the story here. And so you may be wondering what an oracle is. We don't really use that language a lot, but an oracle is a medium through which a prophecy is given. And so that's what we have here. It's called an acted oracle. It might be something like an object lesson in our language. So you have this oracle, this object lesson. And so Elisha, he seeks to encourage Joash here. And he tells him to grab a bow and arrows. And Elisha then puts his hands on the king's hands and says, open the east window and shoot the arrow out of it. And so he's shot. And this is kind of odd, isn't it? Right? Like, what, what's going on here? What, what is he trying to even picture here? But, but notice how Elisha's hands are on the king's hands. God is with his people. He's guiding them. And so then Elisha, he explains this picture. And so if you look halfway through verse 17, he says, the Lord's arrow of victory the arrow of victory over Syria. And so actually the Hebrew word here for victory is the same word used for salvation. Same exact one. The Lord's salvation. And so Elijah is saying that the arrow symbolizes the victory that Israel is going to have over Syria. And so what does Elisha do? He says, shoot more arrows out of the window. Um, He says, strike the ground. Maybe your translation says, smite the ground with arrows. And so let's stop for a moment and think about this. If the arrows in Joash's quiver represent victories in battle over Syria, Elisha's telling him to shoot them out the window, what should he have done? He should have unloaded every single arrow that he had, right? He should have sent them out of the window flying. And so if these are the arrows of the Lord's victories, then then I'm sending every single one that I've got. I'm sending them all out. But what did Joash do? He shoots three of them, and then he stops. The text says Elisha was furious and said, you should have shot five or six times. He goes on to say, now you're only going to deal a partial blow to Syria. And so why did Joash stop with three arrows? Why did he stop with three arrows? Did did he not understand what Elisha was talking about? Did, Did he think it was silly, maybe? Maybe, worst case scenario, did he want Israel to lose? I, I don't think so, but... I think there's a lesson that's being taught here with Joash and with Elisha. The real issue with Joash is that he lacked zeal. He lacked zeal. He was half-hearted. He didn't obey enthusiastically enough. Ralph Davis already mentioned this morning, this is the way he says it, and I think it's perfect. He says, Elisha gives Joash a blank check of the Word of God, and the king says, thank you, I'll only cash half of it. Right? So here we see Joash. He has enough faith to come to Elisha, but but not enough faith to destroy Syria. Just contain them. And so the result of this oracle we see on full display, the half-heartedness of Joash. And if we were to read on, we would see three victories of Syria. Three arrows, three victories come in the following chapters. But then we see the collapse of Israel in 2 Kings chapter 17. Four chapters later, the collapse of Israel. And so if I had to guess, this feeling of half-heartedness kind of hits close to home to us. I I think sometimes I feel very half-hearted when it comes to my faith. Um, And so have we ever encountered half-hearted Christianity in our lives? And so I think this is something that that us theologically-minded Presbyterians can, can very easily fall victim to. Again, quoting Ralph Davis, he puts it this way, he says, but some of us using a degree of right theology, make our Joash response. We become convinced of total depravity and that it is our condition 
We're so bound by certain habits, inabilities, behaviors, and reactions that even though we claim to be Christ, there's no hope or change for trans- hope or chance for transformation. We can be so committed to this idea of total depravity thinking that there's no hope for us. We can't change. This is who I am. And so it would be helpful to examine ourselves. What are the areas in our lives where we're managing sin instead of putting it to death? What are the areas in life that we're trying to contain sin rather than crucifying it? What about our prayer lives? Could that be described as half-hearted? What about our financial giving? Could that be described as half-hearted? What about our studies or our work, depending on where we're called in life? Are we just using three arrows when it comes to these things? And so we've already seen that God is the orchestrator and that the battle belongs to Him. We need to be firing every single arrow that we have because He's given us the arrows of victory. Over a hundred years ago, Charles Spurgeon, he preached a sermon on this text. And he says that we can tend to be half-hearted towards sin. And so he brings up this idea of besetting sin. Besetting sin. It's a real thing. And this is what he says about besetting sin. Oh, says one, that is my besetting sin. How often is that used as an excuse? If I were to go across town tonight, and a dozen men were to come around and knock me down and rob me, I should be beset by them. But when I stop at home and ask them into my house and feast with them, and then let them rob me, I cannot talk about being beset, for I have invited them there. Some believers tolerate themselves in sin. I repeat, they tolerate themselves in sin. And so what are you saying, Jeremy? Are, are you saying that we have to be perfect? Are you saying that we have to be sinless? Well, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there's a difference between being beset by sin and merely tolerating it. It's a big difference. And so how do you know? How do you know if you're tolerating sin or if you're beset by sin? The late David Pallison, he's a, he's a counselor who I, who I love and Love to read his works. He says this. He says, which direction are you going? It's a great article by him that talks about this. It's called Sanctification is a Direction. I highly encourage you to look it up, read it. Sanctification is Direction, David Pallison. But his point is that your direction matters. Are you growing in your will and your desire to fight sin? He says some people, they leap like gazelles. Then he says others crawl along. But what direction are you going? That's what's important. Which direction are you going? And so here we can take a lesson from Joash. Don't be half-hearted. Remember, Philippians 2 reminds us that it's God who wills and works within us. And that even includes our fight with sin. That even includes our struggles that we have. God wills and works within us. So let's look at our last point this morning, the extraordinary. So this passage ends with one of the strangest, most bizarre endings in all of Scripture, but it's very extraordinary. You see it in verses 20 and 21. Elisha dies, they bury him, and then sometime later, a no-name man that we have no clue who he is, he dies, and because there's this invading group of marauders, they have this very hurried funeral, and they throw him in the same grave that Elisha's bones are in. And it says as soon as he touches these bones, he becomes alive, and he walks out of the tomb, and the passage ends there. There's no explanation, there's no commentary, it's kind of said... This is what happened. What does that mean? Well, it's because these two verses here that I wanted to preach this passage. I love these two verses. On first glance, it seems so strange and bizarre, but, but maybe it shouldn't be strange and bizarre to us. I mean, think about how Elijah went out. He never died. He was taken up to heaven. So wouldn't it be fitting for Elisha, who asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, to go out in a truly remarkable way too. So I think there's a huge purpose to these two verses here. So if you recall our first point, we asked the question, what would happen to God's people without Elisha? What's going to happen to them? Well, I think God is sending a message to His people through this act. Let me explain what I mean by this. If you still have your Bibles open, look down at verse 21. It says the man was thrown into the grave. Was thrown. If you look at verse 23... At the very end, it says, nor has he cast them into exile yet. 
So you have these two words here. It's the same root word in Hebrew. Same one. Man was thrown into the grave. Israel's being cast out, thrown out into exile, right? And so there's this parallel here that he's wanting them to see. Just as this dead man was thrown into a tomb, so Israel is going to be thrown into an exile. So Israel is about to head into exile, and we see this as soon as chapter 17. And the prophet has one last lesson for Israel to have. And it's so that they would have hope. Though the prophet Elisha might be dead, the power behind his words is very much alive. Stay close to the words of the prophets of God, and there's going to be life. Elisha, Elijah, they may be gone, but God isn't. And even while you're in exile, He's going to send prophets to help you, to instruct you, to lead you. And so hope isn't lost for Israel. There's also something else here. Tony Moreta, he's a pastor in North Carolina. He calls this miracle the Messianic miracle. And there's only a handful of resurrection accounts in the Bible. And this is one of them. And so it's meant to display the resurrection power of God. And so for those who follow Elisha, death doesn't get the final say. One day, they too will be raised from the dead, just as this man had been. The commentator says, it's as if the last word from both Elijah and Elisha is, don't think death has dominion over you. Death does not have dominion over us. And so as Israel heads into exile, they can hope in the life-giving word of God and His resurrection power. And so I'll close with this. So what? Why does this matter? What does it mean for me and you in Sao in 2023? What does this passage have to say to us? Well, I think it's clear that this passage has a bigger enemy than Syria. An ultimate enemy, and that enemy is death itself. And so in this account of Elisha's bones, what we're seeing is not just a comfort for the people of Israel, but a foretaste of someone who, even greater than Elisha, that's to come. We start to see these glimpses of Jesus here. In Matthew 11, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, and he connects him with Elijah saying Elijah was the prophetic symbol for John the Baptist. And so just as Elijah was the forerunner of Jesus, or sorry, just as Elijah was the forerunner of Elisha, John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus. And so what we can do is we can say that Elisha is a type or prophetic symbol of Jesus. So just like Elisha, Jesus too would die. Matthew Henry wrote that by Jesus' death death and burial, the grave has made all to believers a safe and happy passage to life. Through Jesus, the grave becomes this passage to life. You see, if the ultimate enemy in this passage is death, and if death has been undone, we know that for those in Christ, death is not the ultimate destiny. Just like the unnamed man that encountered Elisha's bones woke up alive, so it is with those who encounter Jesus' death. We wake up alive. And so, the arrow of the Lord's victory in this passage is not just a victory over Syria, it's also a victory over death itself. So the arrow of God's salvation was shot through the incarnation. It hit the ground at Calvary where the enemy was defeated. And so to borrow from John Owen, at Calvary we see the death of death because of the death of Christ. Through Christ's death, there is no more death. And so this is the greatest news of all because if Romans 6.23 is right, that the wages of sin is death, if my sin has been nailed to the cross and Jesus was raised from the dead, this means that my sin has been paid for, that I no longer fear death because death doesn't get the final word. So this is the entire argument that Paul is making in Romans chapter 6. So here's a snippet of what Paul says here. He says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. In the same way, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so, to sum up this whole passage, what I want you to see this morning, that it's in Elisha's life-giving bones that I want you to see Jesus' life-giving cross. So how can I make this a reality for me? Well, I've said it a few times this morning, but I want to make sure that you hear it. Jesus' life-giving cross is available to all people, but there's only one way to access it. It's through faith. Ephesians 2.8 says, by grace that you've been saved through faith. So here's the thing about God's grace. This quote made um, Tim Keller's career. 
You're never so bad that you're beyond the reach of God's grace, and you're never too good that you're beyond the need of God's grace. All right? Say that one more time. You're never so bad that you're beyond the reach of God's grace. You're never too good that you're beyond the need of God's grace. And so, if you're out there and you're struggling with sin, Christ will carry you through. Jesus endured to the end on your behalf, and now He comes back alongside of you, carrying you through, constantly interceding to the Father on your behalf. So rest in that. Let it empower you. Trust that He began. He who began a good work is faithful to complete it. And so if you've not given yourself to Christ today, go to Him today. Go to the foot of the cross. It's not too late. Believe in Him. Surrender to Him. And then hear those great words. My son, my daughter, all your sins are forgiven. And so my question for you this morning is, do you have this faith that gives a life that transcends even death itself? Do you have that? Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for this passage here about this bizarre resurrection through contact of Elisha's bones. Uh, Father, we thank you how it points us to that same life-giving cross that Jesus experienced. That, that through His death and His resurrection, that the power of death over us has been broken, that the power of sin has been broken, that we have access to You. And so, Father, we know that we access that through faith, but yet many of us resonate with that passage in the Gospels that, that I believe help my unbelief. And so, Father, we ask that You help our half-heartedness. Uh, that you, you make us wholly devoted to You. Father, we love You. We thank You for this good Word. And we pray this in the name of Your Son. Amen.